Ezra chapter 3. As we have been covering, we've seen the uh, children of Israel return, at least the first wave of them. Zerubbabel will lead the first wave. Ezra will lead the second wave. And Nehemiah will lead the third wave. And so in chapter 1, we saw where they got permission to come back home. And we see where Zerubbabel and some of the house of David returns. And also the priests return. And their goal is to rebuild the altar and rebuild the temple. And so as we watched that, we saw where they returned. We saw where the priests got busy in chapter 2. And they went through a census to determine who was, as they used to say in the South, bona fide. Who got to belong and who maybe didn't belong. Who truly was of the Jewish heritage and what the role of each person was. Now that we're in chapter 3, we're going to see the rebuilding of the altar and the start on the foundation of the temple. And then in chapter 4, we're going to see a letter writing campaign and see its effect of what we have going through. So let's go ahead and start there in Ezra chapter 3. Looking at verses 1 through 5, we see the rebuilding of the altar. And you'll notice as we get started here in this rebuilding of this altar... We're going to notice where it happens in the seventh month, with this, which is, I call it Tisseri, T-I-S-R-I. Um, it is generally mid-September, early October for us, is what we'd call it with our dates that we have. And it's, it comes three months after the exiles have arrived. So chapter one to chapter three, we're talking about six months. We've given everybody enough time to get back home to kind of figure out where they live, to unpack a little bit. And now the sixth month, we come together, and we're getting ready to um, build the altar. Now, why is the seventh month such a big deal? And you may remember, and probably not if you're very normal, but you might remember when we were covering the book of Numbers, uh, about lesson 10 in the book of Numbers, we spent some time on the sacrifices. And you hit a ton of sacrifices in the seventh month. (coughs) Excuse me. The seventh month is the Day of Atonement. The seventh month is the uh, Feast of, uh, or yeah, Feast of Tabernacles, where you live in a tent. That's the month where everybody leaves home and meets up in Jerusalem. And so everybody arrives there to offer their sin sacrifice. That's also the uh, month between the harvest season and the planting season, so perhaps it's a little bit of vacation for a lot of folks. And it's also the month in which Israel was allowed to leave Egypt, and it's also the month in which Israel entered into the Promised Land. And so right through there, you hit a lot of holidays. It is a very important month for the Jewish person. It's a very important month for the Jewish religion. And so they build this altar and they have it ready so that we're ready for the Day of Atonement to occur and to happen. Now, perhaps you remember how we do the Day of Atonement. You sacrifice a bull, and then you bring two goats, remember? And you bring the two goats, and they cast lots, and the goat that wins the lot or is chosen from the lot, the priest will lay his hands upon the goat, upon the head, and he'll have some of the blood of the bull, on his hands, and as he lays his hands on that goat, they uh, ask for forgiveness, they confess the sins of all the people, and then that goat is released to run out into the hills. And that's what they call the scapegoat. Perhaps you've heard of somebody being called the scapegoat. But he receives all the sins, and symbolically he runs away, never to be seen again. The other goat is brought into the temple and is sacrificed for all the sins of the people. And so the Day of Atonement was a very special day. It's the only day in the Old Testament everybody was commanded to fast. And so we're trying to, as you read through here in chapter 3, hustle a little bit to try to get this altar put together because the seventh month is a very important month for all of this to happen. Now, as you notice, they're building the, uh, as they're building the altar there, uh, both Jeshua, who is the son of David, son of Jehoiakim in the line of David, and Zerubbabel, and their compatriots, compadres, their friends, their followers, they're both there. And so you see the king working with it, and you also see the high priest working with it as well. Now, one thing that's interesting to me 
is in the Old Testament from Numbers through Samuel. It's always the uh, high priest who's in charge of the sacrifice and putting the sacrifice together. And so you see, you know, Eli, you see Samuel as they move around the tabernacle. Once you begin to get to David, you see a little bit of involvement from the king. Now, the king's not allowed to sacrifice. You remember Uzziah? He lost his hand because he tried to sacrifice upon the altar, King Uzziah. But you also see that while the priests were doing the altar, the kings generally built the, um, built the temple, built the building that goes around the temple. You have Solomon's temple, you have Zerubbabel's temple, and later you'll have Herod's temple. And so it's interesting seeing how those two interact and work together as you see that. Uh, always remember, when you build an altar, it's always made out of uncut stone. It wasn't hewn together necessarily, and that comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. And that's looking back to the roots of the old days, whenever um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would... Wherever they were, Bethel or wherever it might be, they'd be putting together the altar and all those sort of things. So the Gentiles would make something that looked like a brick, you know, square blocks, and they would make their altar out of that. The uh, Jewish um, altars tended to be a little bit more on the rough-looking side and that sort of thing. All right, then so they come back and we build the altar. And we've mentioned before in some of our classes the significance of the location of where this altar goes and you read through a lot of commentaries and a lot of times people will say well if the temple was destroyed the altar was destroyed how in the world would they have any idea they knew they knew very well where this altar went and it's interesting to follow through the uh, generations to see the significance of what's going on here and of course in 2nd Samuel 24 24 we see where David has sinned against the people. In his pride, he took a census. He wanted to know just how big and powerful and rich he was. And he was uh, destroyed by God. He suffered from God because of this. A plague came upon the people. And so the prophet Gad said, listen, you need to go and build an altar. And you need to sacrifice to God so that this plague will disappear. And so he goes and he's traveling outside and outside of Jerusalem, and he meets a man named Aruna. Aruna owns this land that's kind of on this ledge, and he says, listen, I've got to build an altar very quickly. Let me buy your oxen. Let me buy your cart. I'll use the wood to burn your oxen I'm going to sacrifice. And Aruna says, this is a noble thing. Just take it. I'll, I'll donate it to you. Let's get this thing going to save the people. And what does David say in response to that? I will not give to the Lord that which cost me... Yeah, I will not give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. Now, if you want to define worship, a lot of times we hang out John 4, 24, correct? Worship in spirit and in truth. We talk about worship, a lot of times we... Look at Romans 12, 1. We're a living sacrifice. A lot of times we look at worship and we see Matthew chapter 4. You know, you shall serve the Lord your, serve the Lord your God and worship Him with all your heart. That's Matthew 4, 4, if I'm not mistaken. This is as good a definition of sacrifice or worship as whatever else you might find. Don't give to God that which costs you nothing. What about in the preaching? You need to give your heart completely to what's being found in the Word of God. Look, look for application. Look for memorization. Look to grow closer to Him. And singing, sing with whatever you got. You might be a, you know, an alto, a soprano, tenor, or a bass. Some of us are also's in our singing. In your prayers, in your Lord's Supper, take it seriously every time that you take it. Take it in a worthy manner, the way that God commanded for you to take. And in your giving, your giving needs to be a sacrifice to God. In your daily life, your Christianity, don't give to God that which costs nothing. Too many of us, and I include myself in that, fall into this thing to where we say, hey, it's comfortable. 
and this is just comfortable living, and so I, as long as it's comfortable, I'm going to be a Christian. As long as this is easy, God, would, you and I will be on the same team. David says, I'm not going to give to God that which costs me nothing. That is a huge, significant statement in the Old Testament. And so at that point where that altar is, in the next generation, Solomon puts his temple right on that threshing floor. Geographically, that is where it goes. Here we are 70 years later, really longer than that, but several hundred years later, as we've gone through the divided kingdom, as we've gone through the captivity, when they come back, they know where that is, and they put that altar in the same place. Don't give God that which costs nothing. Now, in the generation after this, about 450 years, Jesus, the true Yeshua, is going to come, and when he comes, he meets in the temple, even at the age of 12, and confounds the rulers of the law because of his understanding. He spends time in that temple cleansing it, from mankind's selfishness and at the end of his life he right outside of that temple just a few hundred meters upon the hill is crucified and as you look at him on the cross that same statement rings true don't give to God that which costs nothing and so as you go through there and as you read about that you see just the power that this altar holds. You see the importance of this altar which is here and the power of everything that's there. Now, you see uh, the people of the land. And as you read there in the book of Ezra and as you cruise through that section, you see as they're building this altar and as they're working on this section, there's a fear that they have of the people of the land. And you're going to read about them throughout the rest of the book of Ezra. And you're going to read about them as you keep going right along. And so, let's talk about this fear of the people of the land. Um, look there in verse 3. The fear of the people of these countries is what this passage says. Who are these people? Now, in my notes, I realized this morning as I was putting it together, I described these people twice in the notes. So, I guess I really want you to figure that out there, which is there. Remember the northern nation. You got Israel and Judah. Remember that in your Bible classes? Northern nations taken over by the Assyrians. The Assyrians have an idea that the way to keep people from rebelling is you take them away from their home. If you take them away from their home, don't let them be in a group of more than 100 people of their own nation and mix them with everybody else. Nobody will have any patriotism because everybody's mixed. You can't say, hey, my country's better because you have everybody else there saying their country's better as well. And so that was the Assyrians' idea. And so they took the Jews that they conquered in the 700s and they just scattered them all over the world. Well, now there's an empty spot, spot where these people had lived. And so they take Babylonians and put them there. And they take Philistines and put them there. And they take Persians and put them there. People from all over the world end up there. And, of course, when they're brought, they bring their idols, they bring their gods. And so you see just all these pagans and all these religions and everything that's going on there. And so this is 2 Kings 17 that we're talking about. And you may remember this from your Bible classes. 2 Kings 17, looking there in 25, suddenly the lions arise and start eating all the people who are there. And it becomes a pretty serious situation. Um, they're just eating people left and right. And so the king hears about the serious problem. There's lions everywhere. And so the question is, how do we stop it? And someone tells him, one of his magicians, tells him this is happening because we've removed the god of the land from his home. And we got to fix this problem. And so what, how do you fix it? He said, I'll take a priest and I will send him to that land, and he will reintroduce the worship of God. He's going to be up in Bethel. He's going to be back there in that area where uh, Samuel was and Eli was. And as he brings him there, it's just north of Shiloh, he's going to reintroduce the land to know God, and that's going to get rid of the lions. And it seems that that works, as you look there in 2 Samuel 17. But here's the problem. What happens with all those people is now... You had the worship of God, but you also had the worship of Baal. You also had the worship of Molech. 
You also had the worship of Tigith Palazar. Of all the people's gods, they're all brought together. Ecumenicism is what I call it a lot of times. And so all these people are brought together. And as they're brought together, it's a homogenous, or it's not homogenous, it's dehomogenous. It's a mixture of all these religions kind of mixed together. A little bit of Jewish, a little bit of Philistine, a little bit of Babylonian. They just kind of take what they think is the best from every religion, and that's what they're following. Now, what you have going on here is this new religion. And in the New Testament, we're going to call these people Samaritans. Remember John 4? You know, hey, we worship a Gerizim. The Gerizim's as good as Jerusalem because that's what they decided their God was going to do. And hey, we worship in this way and that way. And so now we are coming with this different religion, which is there. And so they're pagan because they worship so many gods, but they copy some of the Jewish stuff, and they bring some of that sort of stuff in. And so their idea of Jehovah God is, well, he's the local God. So we'll go ahead and include him since this is where we live. This is kind of what we do. And so they really didn't know the law of Moses or follow the law of Moses. And so what you see here in chapter 4 or chapter 3 is they arrive and they say, hey, here we are building an altar. Here we are building a temple. Hey, let us join. We like your God too. You know, we, we follow some of what your God teaches. And so let us hop and worship because, you know, let, let's celebrate what we have in common in re- rather than celebrate our differences. Let's celebrate the fact that, yes, we think you have one of the gods, and so that's a pretty cool thing. And so we want to come and help, and we want to come and be a part of this. All right? What's the Jews' response to that? No, right? Why are the Jews so judgmental? Why do the Jews think they're the only ones going to heaven? Why are the Jews thinking that they have the right way and nobody else does? Well, there's a little bit of jealousy there with these other folks wanting to come in. Okay, they recognize what sent them into captivity. As you read the end of 2 Kings... You see where they brought Molech even into the temple. And you see where there were idols all over the place. You read in Ezekiel, you see there's idols in every corner of that temple. And because of that, God judged them and put them for 70 years in exile. And they don't want to go back. And so they know you can't mix God with anyone else. And so what you have here is a need to remain pure. And need to remain not mixed with anything else that is out there. And so they're fighting against this pluralism in religion. And there's also something deeper here, which we're going to see as we get later in the book, looking at Tobiah and Sanballat and some of these others. They're deeper. These folks are deeper than the religious angle. The power right now, the the, uh, capital of this province right now is Samaria. And they know that if Jerusalem is rebuilt, Jerusalem is better situated commercially than Samaria is. It's closer to the routes, routes in which people will take. And they realize that this place gets their altar back, and if they rebuild a, an awesome-looking temple, and they rebuild the walls to become a major, major place commercially, economically, the capital is going to move from Samaria to Jerusalem. And they realize you're going to lose a lot of power if you allow these people to do what they're planning on doing. They've been used to, for these last 70 years, being the only people in town, only people in the province, and they realize the power base is about to move. So they come down and say, hey, let us help. Are they really going to help? They're not. They're going to confuse. They're going to you know, make fun of people. They're going to try to slow things down. They're going to try to make it where it doesn't work the way it should. And so, oh boy, we're, we're really getting after it. We're really seeing the issues which are going on here. Now, there's a problem today, even among our people. 
a lot of people say, as long as you're sincere, that's enough. Just, you know, be somebody who believes. Whatever it is you believe, that's enough. There's some people who say, well, you know, as long as you're religious, any religion is good. What does God want us to do? Who does God want us to follow? Okay, follow your Bible. Follow Jesus. And Jesus will get you to heaven. All right? You got John, you got Peter, and you got Paul. All three of those people were Christian. They were disciples of Jesus. They all lived in the first century. All of them, when they were martyred, John died. He wasn't martyred, but he died in the faith. Went to heaven. Now, every denomination that you look up was established well after that first century. Some of them established 1385. Some of them established 1914. Some of them established 1963. We can go through every denomination and look at when it's established. But if what John, Paul, and Peter taught got them to heaven, they got to heaven without being a member of a denomination. That means we should go to heaven without being a member of a denomination. Just be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm a Christian preacher. I'm not a Church of Christ preacher. If you're looking at the idea of a Church of Christ being a denomination. We have finished this. This is all the people that are coming through. And so as you read 6 to 13, you start reading about these foundations of the temple. And the people, uh, we're trying. We've got the money given to us by the king in chapter 1 and verse 2. And so after we've built this altar, we send off to the Sidonians. We send off to Lebanon. We're going to bring down cedar. We're going to bring down the special wood, the same stuff that Solomon had. So we're attempting to make it as nice as what Solomon had. So they start selling and buying and everything to try to get this stuff together. And so they build the foundation. We haven't built the walls. That's not going to happen until about chapter 6 and 7. But we build the foundation of the temple. And as you build that foundation, the, the people begin to look at it. And as they look at it, the ones who are young are super excited because we've come home from slavery and now we've got our own temple. We've come home from slavery and God has put us back just like he promised he was going to bring us back to. This is awesome. <coughs> and so just like in the days of David, I love how they say that, not Moses, not the law. As David had said, now they have these silver trumpets. Now they have the cymbals. They are making all the noise that they can, and they are excited. Now, everybody who's over 70, who actually saw Solomon's temple, what's their reaction? They're crying. Because they've been waiting 70 years to come home, and this is what we come home to. This is what we come home to. All right. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Haggai, or Haggai. I heard somebody call it Haggai one time. Haggai, that's a minor prophet. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Three books from the end of the Old Testament. Or if you're one of those modern kids... You just type in H-A-G-G-A-I and it pops up. Okay. Hey, guy, chapter 2, Lord willing. Okay. In the seventh month, this is verse 1, 21st of the month, where the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who left among you has saw the temple, this is verse 3, in its former glory, and how do you see it now? And comparing with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. This people are saying, hey, this temple's not as big as I want it to be. Now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Zehodak, high priest. And be strong, all you people in the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you and came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land. 
and I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all the nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. A little bit of preview of Jesus hanging out in the temple. A little bit of preview of Acts chapter 2 here. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Now verse 9, big deal here. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the glory of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. All right. In my language, what I'm saying here. God says, don't say it's nothing. God says, I own all the gold and the silver. If I wanted to make it as big as Solomon, I would. But I've got this smaller temple. The smaller temple is going to be greater because of what's inside of it. You go to Solomon's temple and you've got the huge overlay of the gold everywhere. You've got the silver. You've got the shields. You've got all this awesome stuff. Largest building in the world at that time. This new temple doesn't look all that fancy. But God says it's better because guess who's going to be in it? Well, okay, we're in the church. Who's going to walk inside this temple? Jesus. Jesus is walking inside this temple. This is where he's going to be recognized by Anna, the prophetess. This is where he's going to be talking to the, the people when he's 12. This is where he's going to be cleansing out the temple. This is where he's going to be healing people. This is where the very first gospel sermon is going to be preached on the portico, Solomon's portico, right outside this temple. This place is a lot better. Now, I have a sermon that I love to preach out of this section. And one of these days I may preach it here, if y'all don't remember what I'm about to say. And in the sermon, just about every congregation or many congregations of the Lord's Church can look back about 30 or 40 years and they used to be a lot larger. And because of that, some people who remember the old days look at the church today and say, there's nothing good happening. We're shrinking. There's nothing left. And we look back and we're not encouraged by what we see. But I think we should look at the Lord's church and be encouraged by what we do see. There's a lot of good stuff happening in the church. There's a lot of wonderful things going on with God's people. And we're here. God is working through us. And I can't control yesterday. And I sure can't control what happens in this congregation in 20 years. But I have a part. I have a role to play in what happens in this congregation today. And you do as well. And that's what makes this body of Christians so very special. And so that's one of my fun sermons to teach and every once in a while I get to do it all right so we build the altar we built the foundation here we're trying to work on building the temple around the altar and the people have shown up and now they are trying to do everything they can to intimidate we're in chapter four and so they're sitting there fighting and going back and forth trying to make sure that these people are not going to be successful in what they're doing and trouble begins to brew, and they're doing everything that they can. And so that brings us to verse 6. They write a letter, and they send it back to the king. Now, the original king, Cyrus, is dead now. It's been a good time. We, we've jumped in time about 10, 12 years. And they write a letter. And in this letter, they say, hey, king, over there in, over there in Persia, you don't remember this, but if you look through the records... You know, David and Solomon, they conquered a lot of people. There was a lot of rebellion here. If you remember Josiah, he was fighting against the Babylonians and Egyptians. If you let these people have their own city, it's just a matter of time until they have a revolution. They get away from everybody, and then you're not going to have a state over here at all. And so they send that letter off, and the king reads it. And the king comes back, and he says, you've got a point. And the king just hears that perspective, and he sends back a letter, and he says, well, tell them that they're not allowed to build. And so we're going to go for 15 years until we're able to build again. And that's what brings us to Haggai and Zephaniah as we go through there. All right, let's look at the, uh, some of the application questions. Why were the Jews so anxious to start sacrificing in the seventh month? Why were they so anxious to get that altar going? Yeah, yeah, it's what they used to, they wanted the restoration, okay? 
of why did some people cry when the foundation was laid? Because it didn't compare, right? Their memories were bigger. Why did the local people oppose the Jews' reintroduction of worship? They were afraid of losing economic power. Okay, application. The time to begin restoration. Next week, I'm going to start my diet. You ever hear somebody say that? Time to start restoration is today. Ecumenicism is dangerous even today. Follow only the true gospel. Restoration's result looks small, but God's impressed with only just a few. Don't be shocked when people oppose your faith. You will face persecution. And even if you get stopped, don't stop. Take heart. Get started again. It's not how many times you fall. It's how many times you get up, right? All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the time we had together.